Mark 11, 12 to 14, and 20 to 26, Faith and Forgiveness. Have you ever read a book that goes back and forth between what is happening to one person and then to another in a totally different place? As I recall, A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens is like that. The book begins with the well-known statement, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, referring to what it was like in the different cities. It's an interesting way to tell two stories at the same time. I thought of that as I read through the end of Mark 11 this week. <clears throat> the reason for this is that Mark goes back and forth between two subjects at the end of this chapter. One part, which we will study today, is about prayer, faith in God, and forgiveness. That's in Mark 11, 12 to 14, and then verses 20 and 26. The other part is about Jesus clearing of the temple and the religious leaders' response to him. That's from Mark 11, 15 to 19, and then 27 to 33. You will notice that Mark starts with one thought and then goes to another before returning to the previous thought. So as to keep the topic separate, we will look at the first part now and the second part at another time. Let me read the passage to you. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again, and his disciples heard it. Then we move down to verse 20. <clears throat> now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Our first question, what does it say? Well, during the next day, Jesus was hungry as he left Bethany. You may recall last week we looked at how Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem riding on a donkey's colt. And the people received him as if he was the Messiah. <clears throat> so, during the next day, Jesus was hungry as he and the disciples left Bethany. From a distance away, Jesus spotted a fig tree with leaves. He went over to see if he could find something to eat on it. But when he arrived, he found only leaves because it wasn't the season for figs. Jesus responded by saying to it, Let no one eat from you ever again. The next morning, as they passed by the tree... The tree had dried up from its roots. Peter remembered what had happened and said, Rabbi, the fig tree that you cursed has withered away. Jesus responded by telling the disciples to have faith in God. He said, It was certain that if someone told the mountain to be removed and be cast into the sea, if he didn't doubt in his heart but believed it would be done, he would have whatever he said. With that in mind, Jesus told them that whatever they asked for when praying, they should believe that they had received those things and they would. He also told them that when they were praying, if they had anything against another person, they should forgive him, so that their father might also forgive them for their trespasses. But if they didn't forgive, neither would their father in heaven forgive their trespasses. So here Jesus talks about a fig tree. He talks about faith in God. And he talks about forgiveness. Now, what does it mean? The first thing we see is Jesus publicly cursed the fig tree to teach a lesson. When you read what happened in these verses, you may have some questions. Was Jesus really hungry? Yes, even though Jesus is God, he came to earth as a real person. Because of this, like us, he experienced hunger. As he walked toward Jerusalem, he was looking for figs on a tree or something to eat while he was on the way. But after finding none, he cursed the tree. Now, a couple questions. <clears throat> Why did Jesus curse the tree? As God, Jesus knew whether the tree had figs on it before he arrived. As the Creator, Jesus knew that it was not the time of year for figs to be growing. However, I have been told that, and I quote here, fig trees produced crops of small edible buds in March, followed by the appearance of large green leaves in early April, unquote. 
Supposedly, these buds were what poor people would eat when in need. So Jesus could have been looking for these edible buds to eat. In any event, it seems strange for Jesus to vindictively curse the tree for not producing something to eat. Why did he curse it? I think the answer is found in the end of verse 14 and then verses 20 and 21. Mark tells us that his disciples heard it when he cursed the tree. And the next day they saw the dried up fig tree. Remember what Peter said? Master, look, the tree you cursed is dried up. This was the reason why Jesus cursed the fig tree. He did it to teach the disciples a lesson. The tree had not done wrong. Jesus was not angry or vindictive. He did this to teach the disciples the lesson he wanted them to learn about faith. It was an illustration of faith in God. So Jesus publicly cursed the fig tree to teach a lesson. Our second point, <clears throat> Jesus gave great power to believers. You see that in verses 22 through 24. Let's read them again. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes the, that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So Jesus gave great power to believers, but we need to talk about this. So, having gotten their attention with the dried-up fig tree, Jesus used the opportunity to teach them a lesson. He told them that they needed to have faith in God and that they could do impossible things like telling a mountain to be cast into the sea if they believed without doubting. Let's talk about this for a moment. According to one source, the Mount of Olives, which would have been nearby, is 2,652 feet above sea level. If you were to put all the rocks and dirt from that mountain onto a scale, it would weigh more than anyone could possibly move. It would be impossible to move. And then the sea. The nearest sea to Jerusalem would be the Dead Sea, and it's approximately 14 miles from Jerusalem. How many of you are good at throwing a baseball? The record distance for throwing a baseball is held by Glenn Gorbis. He threw a baseball 445 feet 10 inches. That's quite a feat, but is nothing compared to throwing something 14 miles. Throwing something into the sea from Jerusalem would be impossible. Add to that the fact that Jesus was talking about speech that would cause a mountain to be cast into the sea. Can you speak and cause something to happen? If you have a cat, you know the impossibility of causing it to do anything by speaking. Mountains are like that. Nobody can tell a mountain to do anything. It is impossible. But Jesus said that this impossibility was possible through faith in God. God could do the impossible for those who believed him. His main message was that their prayers should be filled with faith in God. Look at verse 24. He says, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. The disciples were to pray with faith, believing that God would give them what they asked for. God can do the impossible. And those who believe in him can do great things when they pray in faith without doubting God's ability. A third thought. Jesus taught that God's forgiveness is affected by our own. God's forgiveness is affected by our own. Jesus began his teaching about forgiveness by talking about when the disciples would stand to pray. I'm going to read those verses, verses 25 and 26. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. So he's talking to them about when they stand to pray, whether they have forgiven others. Before praying, they were to consider whether they were holding something against another person and forgive that person. If they forgave the other person, God would forgive them for their own trespasses. But if they did not forgive, God would not forgive them. Well, I have two questions about this passage. <clears throat> the first is this. When would the disciples stand to pray? We're most familiar with the self-righteous, self-centered Pharisee who stood while praying, Luke chapter 18. 
But the Bible says that Hannah stood while she prayed to God to have a son, 1 Samuel 126, and that King Jehoshaphat stood when praying for God's help, 2 Chronicles 20. Perhaps standing to prayer was just, and I quote here, a common prayer posture among Jews, unquote. But it may also refer to a prayer made in public when others are around. With what Jesus said about forgiving others, I lean toward this being a public prayer while standing. Another question, what is a trespass? According to the Greek scholars Reinecker and Rogers, a trespass is a false step, a fall from the right course, an error, a mistake in judgment, a blunder, transgression. In other words, a trespass is when someone does something that is wrong. It seems to include both errors and outright sin. With that in mind, Jesus was telling his disciples that when they prayed, they were to remember to forgive others if they expected God to forgive their sins. It would be hypocritical to receive God's forgiveness, but at the same time hold a grudge against someone who had done them wrong. I'm going to read a, a longer quotation from one commentary. Here's what it says. This is not to say that failing to forgive others or reconcile with those we've offended causes us to lose our salvation. You go to Ephesians 1, 13 to 14 to read about that. Nor does it mean we can earn salvation by being forgiving. Titus 3, 5. The point is the petty way in which we as sinners assume we have a strong relationship with God Meanwhile, we often won't forgive comparatively minor offenses committed against us. And that's true. Jesus taught that God's forgiveness is affected by our own. Now, how do these things apply to us? How does it apply? Here's a question. What is God doing to get your attention? We often see in the Bible how God used illustrations and events to get the attention of his people. In this one, Jesus used the fig tree as an illustration. The Old Testament is filled with prophets using vivid illustrations in public to show the people what God wanted them to know. It is no surprise that Jesus used this illustration of the dried up fig tree to teach his disciples something. But it should make us wonder something ourselves. What is currently happening in your life that God is using to get your attention? Last night we heard about the attempted assassination of a former United States president. We heard about someone in an assisted living home who is close to death. We hear sometimes of someone who has lost their job and is in need of help. While these are not as vivid as a cursed fig tree, they nonetheless get our attention. And in a much clearer way, what is it that God is teaching you through the Bible? As you read the Bible on your own, what is he trying to teach you? As you think through this morning's Sunday school lesson, what is he trying to teach you? As you listen to the pastor's message, what is God trying to teach you? Be sure to keep your eyes and ears open to find out what God is trying to tell you. Then once you know what it is, respond to it. Allow God to work in your life and make the changes that are necessary. Another question. Do you expect God to answer your prayers? Many people have focused on their own faith instead of on God's ability. Some churches use these statements about faith to teach that if you believe, you will receive. This seems to devolve into believe and you'll get what you want, or you just need faith. This has led some to believe really hard about a new car or a health situation, regardless of what God wants for them. To counteract this wrong teaching, we need to focus on the first part of Jesus' teaching, before focusing on the second part. First, we are to have faith in God. This is the most important part. God is the omnipotent creator of the universe who can do anything he wishes. He is the one who can move mountains and cast them into the sea. Think of how God created everything. Then recall how he destroyed the whole world with a flood. Think of the many times God healed people or how he delivered kings from much larger armies. Think of David versus Goliath. When faced with impossible difficulties, remember who God is. He is able to do the impossible. Do you believe that? Second, we are to have pure faith. Jesus made these promises to those who would believe without doubting. If you think about it, why are we even praying if we don't believe that God can answer our prayers or that he will? 
And if we believe that what we are asking is something God would approve of, why would we think that he would not answer our prayer in a positive way? I think that this kind of faith is something that must come from God. As you learn to trust him, your faith in his ability will grow. But there's a third thought here, and I find this in other places in the Bible, but I think it applies here. Third, we must recognize that Jesus' statement here is not an unlimited get-what-you-want-for-free coupon for obtaining what we desire. Remember what the psalmist said, Psalm 37, 4-5, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. In this psalm and in Jesus' statement, we must remember that God has a purpose behind how he answers prayers. But when we are delighting in God's ways, the desires of our heart will change to match his. So we must keep in mind that our prayer requests, as one man has said, must be in harmony with God's will. I'm going to give you a couple Bible passages to think about. How about Mark 14, 36, Matthew 6, 9 to 10, John 14, 13 to 14, John 15, 7, John 16, 23 to 24, and 1 John 5, 14 to 15. Another question. Are you holding a grudge against someone? When Jesus brought up the idea of having anything against anyone, the disciples may have had this very problem. Maybe the disciples were still mad at James and John for wanting to be on either side of Jesus' throne in his future kingdom. Or maybe there was something else that had bothered them. Now they had to think about their own grudges and how it would affect their relationship to God the Father. How about you? Are you holding a grudge against someone? Think about this for a moment. As you pray to God and thank him for his forgiveness, think of the magnitude of God's forgiveness. You have sinned against him more times than you can remember, and you still do. How can you hold a grudge against someone else when God had so graciously forgiven you for your own sins against him? Ephesians 4.32, we read this, And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. When you go to prayer, there are a number of things that will hinder your relationship to God. One is sin in your own life. Make sure that you take care of that first of all, and know that he is willing to forgive you. But another is your own lack of forgiveness toward others. If you are not willing to forgive that person who has wronged you, why should God do the same for you? If you're holding a grudge against someone, make sure that you make things right with them today. Forgive them just as God forgave you. <clears throat> in conclusion, Christians have a unique privilege in prayer. It is an opportunity to talk with God, the God Almighty, our Creator, and the one who loves us despite our sinfulness. And the more amazing thing is that God actually wants us to pray to him. He wants to hear from us. That is a wonderful privilege, but we mustn't take it for granted. This week, as you talk with the Lord, remember the things that we have learned from Jesus. God can do the impossible, but will you trust him?